Hello everybody, thank you for coming. I'll try to entertain you while we are all waiting for lunch. And uh, mm, well, the subject of uh, this talk is um, how to build a model that's, well, m using some predictive modeling, using some data, and in a way that will be uh, successful uh, in the long term. Uh, first, a couple of words, uh, uh, a, a couple of additional words of personal context, which I think are relevant for this talk. So, uh, currently I work at uh, two places. Uh, first of all, uh, in AdFirm, we are, are an ad tech firm, which uh, uses a lot of AI because um, there is really uh, no other way around when doing things like real-time bidding. Uh, and if you want to do it efficiently, then you need some uh, models to uh, help you with this work. So that's uh, my uh, current industry profile, but I'm also a, a researcher. I'm also doing AI-based uh, research in Warsaw University of Technologies, and that allows me to view the whole AI uh, thing from uh, two perspectives, and that also allows me to state roughly this. Uh, in November 2019, AI is highly overhyped. And uh, if you ask why, the, well, then um, looking back at the, the past couple of years, we've seen numerous um, uh, occurrences of AI all over the media, in blogs, in YouTube videos, it's basically everywhere. When you look at the research community, there is a massive amount of paper connected with AI, connected with machine learning, but also some uh, start to arise that are stating that we are making, uh, we are simply going too fast and the progress that's, uh, the apparent progress we're making is not as big as, as everyone might think. That's from the research perspective, while from the industry you can see things like uh, this report made by MMC which uh, states that roughly half of Europe's AI startups don't have any algorithms. And that probably is something you should, uh, you should be concerned about if thinking about using AI in the long term, if uh, thinking about it as a uh, disruptive uh, technology. And the, the thing we should remember about machine learning, about AI, about, about all those buzzwords we are hearing constantly is uh, well, uh, nicely put by Pedro Domingos, who stated that, well, machine learning is not magic. It's just a set of tools. You cannot uh, get magical results from them. You can get more from less, but you should remember, it's not a, a magical uh, bullet uh, to solve all your problems. And uh, why uh, am I talking about uh, this uh, hype, about this um, uh, enormous interest in AI, because as uh, is with uh, hype, we have a hype cycle that starts off with not much interest, then shoots up to a peak of enormous expectations, and then drops uh, dramatically. And we've seen that in the AI community many times, we had AI winters before, and currently we're probably somewhere here at this downward slope of of interest at the uh, place where people are realizing that maybe some uh, some uh, promises were not kept, maybe some uh, people were talking about uh, things that are not yet achievable, uh, but we do would not want that because after that, if we come to this valley, if we come to this depression, then uh, we will see uh, withdrawn from from the technology, and it it won't uh, do as much good as w as it could. So that's the purpose of our today's talk. We would we would per in a perfect world we would just want to hop over this uh, this deep valley here from a place where it's overhyped to a place where it's just another tool that's being productively used to uh, cope with uh, your problems. And that's, that's the main theme of uh, today's talk. So let's also uh, state some terminology abuse because machine learning is, uh, 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 could be understood in many uh, different ways. What I will be talking about today is building, uh, successfully building working systems which en encompass some predictive models. I would not want to go down the rabbit hole what machine learning is and is this method machine learning or statistics or 
whatever else. That's for us uh, right now for the next 40 minutes, not very important. Let's uh, just focus on uh, building systems which have some models built using data. And we want to build them in a way that all the thing, the, the whole thing is successful. So uh, when looking from a top level perspective on a typical ML project, on a typical ML emerging system, uh, the process uh, starts with defining and on this, w well, it starts with some business need. Uh, something uh, is missing from the world, something is missing from your company, something is missing for your customers and you want to uh, start with defining that need, start with understanding it, start with uh, precisely uh, listing all the requirements that should be filled uh, in order to to uh, make a solution for, for, your, for your purposes, for your need. That's, that's a very, very important part and we'll come back to that uh, numerous times during this talk. If your need is settled, then you need to map your business uh, world to your machine learning mo uh, world. You need to map your needs and requests to machine learning modeling tasks. Then when you uh, g have this done already, then you basically gather and analyze uh, the data you will use for training, the data you will use for exploratory analysis. Uh, when, you're s uh, when you're satisfied with your uh, findings, you start the fun part, you start building your model, you start picture engineering, you start uh, parameter tuning, you start all that uh, data science process we've seen, for example, during our previous two talks in uh, this very room. After that, when you're satisfied with your model, you have to select which one is, uh, which one is uh, the, 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 the final one, which one will go to the production phase. Then you serve it on your production environment, use it for your customers, use it for your purposes, and it works until you think that you can create a better one, then you uh, kind of start the whole thing again. Uh, this roughly relates to a crisp DM uh, workflow without uh, without all the uh, arrows and there are some uh, some tricky parts in all those steps because uh, from the point uh, of uh, a business need arising to the point of a working systems uh, there are many places in which you need to be sure that you are actually doing w something that will be useful so you should uh, constantly perform reality checks, whether this model uh, has sense from business point, whether it has sense from a data science point, whether it's something that's, uh, that can be feasibly introduced uh, from a computer engineering uh, point. You should always, always remember that, uh, uh, that what you are creating will actually uh, work on production. You should uh, do reality checks after after each of those phases, but to get a bit more insight about these, let's uh, let's start uh, taking a closer look at each and every one of them. So the road begins from a business need to a first model version so to a, a minimal uh, viable uh, model, and you probably start this this road from asking some questions to your business owner, to your customer, to the one um, that will be uh, the receiver of this model. You need to know uh, whether how, wh what your problem looks like. You need to know it's a specific formulation. You need to be able to map it to modeling tasks. You need to uh, be aware whether you have training data already or whether it's something that you uh, need to gather along the process. Uh, what's very important, you need to have a KPI. You need to have a success uh, criteria which will help you evaluate whether you've done your work correctly or not yet, or maybe it's not even possible. Uh, a success KPI is something that's, uh, that's uh, very, uh, very important. Let's look at a couple of examples. If your business need is, well, for example, creating a recommender system, so your customer or your uh, colleague comes and states that we need recommendations for our web website, then that, in uh, data science terms, 
uh, translate to basically building, a, for example, a collaborative filtering uh, recommender, which of course needs some data to train it, but uh, you only need uh, one model. This is a well understood task in uh, data science. This is a well understood task in uh, among people who are dealing with recommendations, and you also uh, state the success criteria. So you're happy to start with uh, serving your uh, model if it's able to uh, achieve some click-through rates, some, uh, some value of uh, the number of clicks estimated using, of course, the offline data. But if that uh, click-through uh, rate is above some, uh, some threshold, uh, and this threshold should originate from your uh, business owner, from your business need, then you are uh, happy to uh, ship uh, your model. So this is uh, actually a simple case because the business need has um, almost a direct translation into a modeling task and a clearly defined uh, success criterion is also easy to get. Some uh, business cases will be more, more complicated like for example from Adform's uh, sandbox, one of our dynamic pricing uh, models which is uh, responsible for uh, well buying uh, ad impressions within a real-time bidding market and in a way that kind of optimizes the price per such an impression is actually actually consists of uh, three uh, three parts three separate modeling uh, tasks one is connected with forecasting the number of auctions that will be seen for for a given customer for a given uh, for a given uh, advertising campaign another one is responsible for predicting probability of winning an auction and the third one is uh, actually evaluating whether it's even worth winning winning this auction so the the need that from a business perspective is described in only two sentences translates into a couple of models which are uh, created uh, um, well almost independently and also uh, again we need to define a success criteri criterion we want our um, our model to have a lower cost per uh, for winning an auction than uh, the current approach than the static approach. So we are, uh, so the bu business need also defines our success criterion because we want a dynamic model instead of a static one. Then that means that the prices we get from uh, winning the auction using the dynamic model are better than the current approach, which is uh, using the static uh, pricing. So uh, these three things uh, re uh, encompass uh, the the, the f formulation of requirements for making uh, the machine learning uh, models which will end up uh, as part of our system and th the, the success criterion is all very often the most difficult part uh, to, to estimate because it's easy if uh, easy enough if you are, for, for example, switching from uh, one, uh, if you have a current uh, approach that you want to switch to something better, then you might use your current approach uh, as a baseline. But if you're doing something new, then uh, it's difficult to estimate what a su success criterion should be. Some ideas that work in practice are, well, uh, whether uh, your uh, customer expectations will be fulfilled by applying this model, whether there are, I don't know, revenues will grow or some uh, some metrics important for them will increase, whether they will be more happy. Uh, if you don't have customers, if you're doing the, that internally, you can do what we just uh, described uh, a couple of minutes ago. You can try to come up with something that's better than the currently used approach. The currently used approach, of course, does not have to be any machine learning. It can be just a static model. It can be just a specific practice used in this part of your company. It's uh, something that's actually being uh, replaced by, by your model when, uh, when it's done. If you're developing a completely new product, then it's a good idea to see what your uh, competition is doing to see whether there are some industry, st industry standards uh, concerning 
concerning your situation, whether uh, your model surpasses those standards or not, will define uh, the, the success criterion. And of course, you should always think about whether it's uh, feasible to invest in, in the model, because developing it might take a short period of time, might take a very long period of time, and it all boils down to whether the investment will be feasible. If you have an infinite amount of money and infinite amount of time, then I'll send you my CV. That would be very nice. Usually, uh, it's not the case for real-world companies. So, when we have our modeling task defined, when we have translated the business language into something that a data scientist can understand, the fun part begins. This is the part uh, covered by multiple talks even today. This is the part covered by the keynote. This is the part covered by two previous uh, talks we had in this room. It's basically going from a data set to a working model. And usually what we would want to do is, well, as a data scientist, we would like to play around with the coolest new tools, with the uh, most uh, cited uh, algorithms, with the ones that have nice implementations, with the ones that we can boast about uh, when talking to our friends. And yeah, we would also like the model to have a decent quality, so uh, it surpasses the success criteria, so it gets eventually shipped to, uh, to the production environment, and we don't want to it to fail every now and then. So we want uh, this to be robust, so that this sweet spot is something we are looking for in the space of all possible models uh, out there. Fortunately, usually the case is a bit different, at least at the er early stages. So the fun part is some some somewhere here. It's completely irrelevant to our topic. The quality is here, and well, maybe it's here, maybe it's not. We are not even sure at the early stages. The robust models are the ones we could trust, and we, we end up here at the very first iteration. And that's why this is an iterative process. You, you usually don't uh, do a perfect model with your first try. That's why you need to reiterate a couple of times, that's why you, you sometimes need to go back even to the business requirements, to the success criteria, to data gathering. You do that uh, um, iteratively, try a couple of things and uh, hopefully this will end up in, a, in, a, in something that's uh, viable and works nicely. And the whole modeling part, although there are a million models out there, usually boil, boils down to making uh, three decisions. First, you need to have your model structure, then you need to define the objective function and the algorithm to meet that, to optimize that objective function. There are many uh, answers to all these three, to all these three parts uh, from the model structures begin with linear models through trees, ensembles, SVMs, role-based things, neural networks, Bayesian approaches, a lot of them. Objective functions start from standard things like root mean square error, like accuracy, like uh, some, dis uh, some the distances between distributions like KL divergence, and, and uh, with some things that are customly tailored to your specific need, to your specific bi business case. The same is with optimization methods. You have things like stochastic gradient descent, you have things tailored to specific uh, algorithms like, for example, trees or XGBoost. There are many, uh, many possibilities. And in your fun part, in your model building process, you just reiterate over and over again to till you find the perfect, uh, well, not the perfect, but something that suits your needs, something that's uh, fulfills your success criteria, something that you can trust and run on your production uh, environment. And mm, sometimes the hard part is that, well, you would like to iterate a lot because this usually is the most fun part of the process. This is, uh, if you've been to the last presentation, when uh, there was a nice slide showing how much effort you put into preparing data versus uh, actual model building. So it's like 90% of time of preparing data, 10% of time model building. So this is the 10%. 
right? So this is the, the fourth part, fun part, and you would like to do this over and over again, but at some point you just need to stop because there are some uneasy truths that uh, you need to accept about uh, your creation. It won't be perfect, probably. If it is, then that's probably overfitting, so it's even bad that it's perfect. It won't be eternal. Someone will either turn it off or change it with something newer, something more hip, something that has a b better buzzwords in it. And when you're in this loop, there's always a better one uh, just around the corner. You're thinking, oh, if I just tweak this one hyperparameter and add a couple of neurons in this uh, last layer, then the results will uh, be better and you'd spend one week doing that and then you think tweaking about other things and you spend another week and you go over and over again. Uh, well, this needs to stop at some point because your end goal is not playing around with uh, the, with the modeling part, is shipping something that's meaningful, something that somebody is waiting for into uh, the production. And apart from doing all the uh, all the uh, steps necessary with selecting and uh, training the model, you need to make it uh, into something that's shippable, something that you can deliver to your customers, something that you can deliver to your data center, uh, something that will actually work and uh, produce results which are then used by some system or some person or something else. And uh, in order to do that, you need someone to write the production code. Maybe it will be Jupyter Notebooks, maybe it won't. That, de that greatly depends on your use case, on your load, on your uh, SLAs, on your constraints. But still, somebody m will need to uh, write the code that will be uh, shipped. Someone will need to maintain it over time. And uh, what this place requires is the data science unicorn. So it's a person who understands statistics, understands science, uh, so uh, understands statistics, understands computer science, and is able to understand your business. Those unicorns are uh, apparently very hard to get. So in such cases, mixed teams are very, very successful and very, very handy. And you need three components for such a team. You need the product owner, the link between business and you and data scientists, someone who will understand business uh, and understand what you are actually doing and what can be done and what cannot be done. You need someone to play around with the models, you need someone to mm, develop those beautiful neural networks, and you need someone to make sure that it will be something that will uh, work on production and not blow up your system, because that's uh, not something you, uh, you want uh, to have. So when you finally arrive at the point where you ship uh, your thing into production, the story does not end there because it's running, it's doing something. And it, you cannot just leave it and hope for the best. Well, you could, but that's not going to work. Uh, when you have software components and productions, you need to monitor them. The same thing goes with uh, systems encompassing machine learning models, encompassing predictive models. And there are two types, uh, two types of, of monitoring. One is uh, standard, one is something that we could call uh, internal, and those are the uh, stats typically monitored by software engineers like uh, throughput, like numbers of errors, like garbage collection, etc., etc. The tricky part with machine learning is actually the external uh, monitoring. Because, first of all, uh, the things that get into your system and the things that uh, get out of your systems, uh, these are data dependencies. A machine learning has, um, a, a predictive model has the hard dependencies on data. That means it has hard uh, dependencies on wha what the distribution of its inputs look like, and it has some dependencies on what uh, the, the distribution of its predictions look like. You need to uh, monitor those things along with uh, some business related uh, KPIs um, concerned with, for example, your, uh, linked to your success criteria, linked to your quality, linked to whether your model is doing a good job or not. 
the hard part is actually usually uh, monitoring those data dependencies because uh, your model probably has a lot of inputs. It has a multi-dimensional, very complicated distribution to monitor. And it, had, it has assumptions of how that uh, distribution looks like. And things change. So things like databases change, uh, database changes, uh, new dictionary values, uh, some projects get updated, some refactors are, um, are introduced, some natural changes in processes are also take uh, place over time. And all this um, will uh, slowly but probably surely make your assumptions about the data uh, that goes into your system obsolete. That's why you need to, first of all, make, make these dependencies explicit. You need to know that you are, for example, expecting the, uh, your dictionary to have at most five values. Uh, you are expecting that your uh, input attributes have some certain distributions. And uh, after making them explicit, after uh, realizing what they are, you need to monitor whether they are uh, still true or not. And there are some uh, ideas about how, how to do that, ranging from uh, different difference plots, for example, subtracting the value that's current, uh, from the value that's currently observed, uh, the a value that's, that was observed one week ago, that greatly, um, that, that works perfectly in the very many uh, time series related uh, related uh, situations. You can use uh, heat maps, uh, meaning histograms over time. You can maintain some baseline, uh, some baseline model to see uh, its predictions and to see how your current uh, current approach relates to those uh, naive uh, to the naive baseline and see whether it drifts uh, apart or not. And one one interesting mm, uh, one interesting approach is something that we could call call adversarial. And this allows you to try and monitor the entire uh, input uh, input stream. You basically try to create uh, some model that will uh, be learned to be trained to differentiate whether it's looking at a sample from your tra training data or from your production data. And if you are not able to train such a model, then you can assume that your uh, distributions are roughly the same. If you, the, the problems arise when you, are s uh, when you s train such a model and it starts getting successful. That means that this part and this part have different uh, distributions. They have diverged. So when you have your uh, monitoring uh, in place, then another truth uh, about your model, it won't be eternal. Somebody will, uh, sooner or later will challenge it. Somebody sooner or later with will uh, try to introduce something that's newer, better, nicer, smaller, whatever. And uh, you should think about the procedure how to do it. And there are mul multiple approaches that are feasible depending on your mm, given scenario. A-B tests, uh, causal analysis, and bi Bayesian multi arm bandits. Each one is good in uh, certain situations and bad in others. Let's uh, take a look uh, at them. A-B testing is, I guess, the most often used one. It, it's not used only with uh, models. It's used, for example, with UI changes, like introducing a new color of your click button. Will it be better than your old color of your click button? So that's uh, something that's very often and while, while, while widely used and it basically is a very simple procedure you just have your two things that's been that are that you want to test split your tr model traffic set uh, uh, set the appropriate sample size and the duration of your test wait i mean run it and wait till it's finished and analyze the results and if in Adform, we are doing many, many uh, A-B tests, for example, while evolving our uh, bidding algorithms in the RTB, uh, RTB uh, pipeline. Unfortunately, it turns out that A-B testing is uh, sometimes very, very difficult because a lot of things can uh, get the results to be confusing. You have to correctly split the traffic. And this is difficult because of things like confounding variables, meaning the uh, some properties that make your 
samples uh, not independent, although you are not uh, realizing it. So you think you have independent uh, splits, but they are actually not because of some confounding variables. You can have your samples biased. You can have, o o o of course, feedback loops, which means that over time, the results from one sample influence the algorithm run on another sample. You can uh, have multiple experiments interfering with each other and uh, making the results skewed. Uh, hopefully there, uh, there are some tools which can help you out. One interesting one is Planout, made by uh, Facebook uh, some time ago. This one helps you with uh, proper assignment of the mm, test samples uh, and helps you with analyzing whether your uh, results will be viable uh, or not. Uh, sometimes uh, A-B testing is not possible in principle, because if you have no way to split or you have too little traffic, uh, then uh, you, you, can s you cannot simply do an A-B test. That's where uh, causal analysis kicks in. And one great tool, which is very uh, also quite easy to use, is a thing, uh, f I think, from Google. Might be wrong here, but uh, it's called, anyway, it's called uh, causal impact. And this is a method in which you have your uh, performance which you want to uh, which you want to analyze at an, and at some point you uh, s you run the new version of your uh, of your algorithm and uh, the causal impact works by firstly modeling the performance of your old uh, of your old uh, mm, solution and then calculating the difference between what's actually observed and what the tool thinks that your old solution's performance would be. And this uh, has uh, a nice property that it can be set up even in completely offline uh, environments. Like you could measure, for example, a campaign on billboards placed all over uh, Lithuania, for example, using this, if you're able to measure the, the performance in, if you're able to find some independent uh, signals. Uh, it's a bit more mm, work to uh, set up this, uh, this tool, but uh, works well when you're not able to perform A-B tests. We use it in, se in scenarios when there is not enough traffic to do a proper split. Another scenario which uh, also is uh, found also is useful is when you have uh, many models, you want to run them all at once, and dynamically select the one that's for the specific case uh, that's working better. And these are so-called multi-arm bandit problems. And uh, the, the, the approach allows you to select uh, your, uh, the, the best model for the specific situation. So for example, running an advertising campaign, you have like 10 banners, mm, which some of them will be uh, more uh, appealing to some uh, part of your customers, other banners will be more appealing to other parts of your customers and you want to dynamically uh, s uh, show the, the ones that work the best. multi arm bandits is uh, the way to go and Adform uses it for this very, uh, very uh, case. So these three approaches, A-B testing, causal analysis, or multi-arm bandits will uh, allow you to introduce a newer version of your uh, model. And you could go on and on uh, building new models, introducing them, and living a happy life. But a uh, sad fact in life is that uh, things will eventually go, go wrong. It's you need to expect the unexpected. For example, today I almost missed the keynote because uh, my... Uh, my Uber driver crashed with another guy's Uber driver and I had to catch another one and there was a lot of confusion, uh, confusion among uh, those guys. You should uh, al also expect that some problems will arrive with uh, concerning your, uh, concerning your uh, model. In such a situation you need to have a certain amount of information at hand you need to know whether uh, even it has been called or not, whether what were the inputs and predictions of your uh, model. And the most tricky part, why did the model produce what it actually produced? Uh, explaining predictions is uh, sometimes very, very tricky. Currently, there are two ways to do it. 
you can either have an interpretable model by design, like a uh, rule-based thing, like rules, like trees, like things that a human being can read and uh, understand, or you can apply black box expla explaining techniques. So the interpretable models are, as we just said, logical rules, uh, trees, some scoring systems. If you want to know more about those, then there's a nice paper about explainability. I think it's not that old. Uh, it's either this year or last year. Anyway, worth, worth reading if you're into interpretable models. Sometimes it's the only way to go if you're uh, con uh, concerned with things like medical applications, if you're concerned with things like uh, applying the machine learning in scenarios that you just need to know why the decision was made, then interpretable models is the way to go. If you're not concerned that much about them, you can try post hoc explaining explanation techniques like, uh, for example, Lime or Rice or Dalek. Uh, these are all techniques that are linearly, uh, locally approximate your model and uh, fiddle around a bit with some of its inputs and see how it how those inputs uh, influence the behavior of your model and they produce beautiful plots stating why this decision was made and uh, which of the features had the biggest impact on um, the decision. In that form we use both cases depending on, uh, depending on the place when the model is uh, running. We use rule-based methods to, uh, for example, in our pre-filtering systems, we, where we are uh, concerned that uh, we ha just have to know uh, why a specific filter was uh, applied and uh, wha why was something uh, accepted or rejected. And we use black box methods in places in which we don't have to explain each and every prediction, but we're all more interested in aggregates, we're more interested in the general tr trend. And the last thing I would like to uh, talk about is that when things go wrong and you know that it's your fault, then you have to have a rollback strategy. You probably should not delete your old model immediately because it might turn out to be your uh, well escape route when something goes wrong. You should uh, store it somewhere and a good idea is to use uh, some uh, consistent uh, consistent versioning in a way that if you know that you've got version 2.13.6 running in, in production, you might safely use a version, for example, 2.12.8. And you have that, uh, that knowledge if you're uh, versioning your models in a consistent way, meaning, for example, the major uh, part, like this part, is different assumptions with, uh, with regard to your data, so with your regard to your inputs or, uh, or outputs. The minor ones, uh, the, the middle part is some changes to the hyperparameters, some changes influencing the, uh, the overall performance of your model. And uh, the last suffix is like bug fixes, small tweaks, or even training date could be, could be placed here. This gives you confidence to, uh, to substitute your working model with something that's uh, just lying there stored in an archive. So, uh, machine learning, if it's gonna be successful, then you should probably look at a checklist before, uh, start, uh, before you start using your creation. You should uh, see if your acceptance criteria is met. You should see if your implementation is decent. You should have a plan for uh, for monitoring your uh, model, for experimenting it, for possibly changing it with a newer version. You should uh, um, state and monitor explicitly your uh, data uh, dependencies. And if you do that, then you have higher chances of success. Uh, and it bo oil all boils down to is uh, that AI in itself is not something that gives you a competitive ad advantage. It's not something that will turn your company from not successful to a rock star. It's not just the AI, it's how you use it at and uh, what you build with it. And that's all, thank you. <laughs>